Welcome to our virtual participants and our in-person participants. It's a great honor to be chairing this webinar, which is the first of, um, uh, which is the last of a three-part seminar series um, examining um, what is arguably a very important time in the Philippines. Um, the first webinar focused on the elections, which is back in May. The second webinar focused on the transition from the last administration to the current administration. And in this webinar, we are focusing on a perspective analysis of the current President Marcus Jr. administration. And in this webinar, we are bringing together three amazing speakers who will give us an, um, a broad and detailed picture of the immense political, economic, and security challenges facing the Philippines. Um, we are gathered together here for the in-person participants in Canberra, land traditionally owned and cared for by the Munawal people. And we pay our respect and gratitude to them for their custodianship and extend our acknowledgement of the struggles of indigenous peoples globally. The structure of this seminar is as follows. Bringing together our three speakers, each of them will have 15 minutes to talk about the, their relative um, expertise and their role the um, But after that, we will have hopefully a lot of time for Q&A um, um, from the audience. And so we encourage you to please put in your questions on, for the virtual participants, and um, put in your questions in the Q&A box um, in your screen. Um, without further ado, further ado, I'll introduce our speakers. Um, our first speaker is Julio Cabral Dehanti, who is a professor of political science and international studies at the Natal University, where he served as chair of the political science department. He is also the chair of the international studies department in 2008 to 2015, and the dean of College of Liberal Arts from 2013 to 2017. He served as president of the Philippine Political Science Association, the Asian Political and International Studies. Association. He was the Philippine representative to the Council of the International Political Science Association and is currently regional manager for, for Southeast Asia and the Pacific for varieties of democracy. He has had several visiting appointments, including here at the ANU, as well as universities in Japan, Hong Kong, and the US. Most recently, he was invited to the senior visiting fellow at LSE Saw Street Hong Southeast Asia Center. He appears regularly as a political analyst for local and international media outlets. Our next distinguished, distinguished speaker is Maria Socorro de Choco Bautista, who is a BSP Sterling Chair Professor of Monetary Economics at the School of Economics, the University of the Philippines. She has served as member and chair of the AMRO Advisory Panel, a senior academic advisor at the ADP, as visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and as senior research fellow at the Bank for International Settlements, Asia and Pacific Office. She is an associate editor of the Asian Economic Paper and serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of Economic Surveys, Japan and the World Economy, and Thailand and the World Economy. She holds a BA in economics from Mount Holyoke College, Massachusetts, and a PhD from Columbia University. Last, we have Jay Batonzaco, who is an associate professor at the University of the Philippines College of Law. He teaches courses on property, obligations, and contracts, and law of the sea and natural resources. He obtained his LLB from the College of Law at the University of the Philippines, and master's degree in marine management, and doctorate in the science of law from Dalhousie University in Canada. His graduate degrees were acquired under scholarship grants from the Canadian International Development Agency and the prestigious Pierre Trudeau Foundation, respectively. As you have gathered, our speakers will talk about the new cabinet and the exercise of presidential power, challenges in the macroeconomic situation in the country, and the likely strategies to address them, and finally, security and foreign policy outlook in the country under the current administration. Before I turn over to our um, speakers, and we'll start with the order that I mentioned, um, so we'll go to um, July. Um, please be reminded that our webinar is being recorded and will subsequently be uploaded at the new Mandala website, 
where you can also find um, uh, the recordings for our previous webinars. So I think we are ready. July, are you ready? So turn over. Thank you very much, Maria. I will now, uh, can I share the screen now, please? Yes. Uh, yeah. The whole the hosting is disabled. Okay. Okay. Uh, I would love to thank. Okay. Am I coming in clearly? Can you hear me, yes. Maria? Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay, good afternoon. I would like to thank the Australian National University and the New Mandala for inviting me to share my thoughts on the second uh, Marcos presidency. Um, aside from the election held earlier this year, uh, 2022 will also mark the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Martial Law by the late dictator Ferdinand Marcos in September. It is indeed the height of historical irony that his son, Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos, is the incumbent president after winning the presidential elections. Now, for scholars who have studied uh, democratization, one of the puzzling outcomes in most countries that underwent democratic transitions is the return to power of party personalities who have deep roots in a dictatorship. It is confounding to note that after gaining the right to pick their leaders in free and fair elections, people who would vote for candidates identified with the discredited authoritarian regime. And yet, and yet, Bongbong Marcos has accomplished an unprecedented feat in Philippine politics, that of political resurrection. He won with 31 million or 59% of the total votes cast for the presidential elections. And he is the first majority president in the post Marcos Fifth Republic, another historic irony. Now, despite being ousted from power and relegated to the political fringes for more than three decades, the Marcos dynasty has made a historic political comeback. Despite losing the vice presidential race and the subsequent electoral protests, the son and namesake of the late dictator. Ferdinand Marcos has emerged as the country's 17th president. Why? One of the common uh, reasons uh, being uh, uh, raised by most pundits is disinformation, perhaps some nostalgia for the golden age. But of course, not all 31 million could have been misled by social media. The victory of Bongbong Marcos in the 2022 presidential elections was indeed unprecedented. But also in observer Philippine poll, the question is, will victory strengthen the Fifth Republic or will the story mark the end of the Republic? Either serve sequel or a prequel. People find themselves in difficult to lead based on relationships. Whereas presentations and uh, agency by his structural culture uh, is do so the power to end this constraint in the 
context, regime consists of a political narrative, a coalition of elite strategic and based on the of key institutions. Historical has gone to its coverage of this. Early regime of the revolution or the nation struggling to be born. It was characterized the public of the colonial second republic under Jose in the post-war neo or Cold Republic. Spawn, Pratic, but the Ferdinand, if you did very same, uh, introduce his own republic, which is authoritarian. Alive. And yeah, after, yes. Um, yeah. we, we've been losing you intermittently. Um, uh, can you, um, uh, maybe start again on this particular slide. We lost you for a bit. Um, and I think it's a okay. very common one that you're saying. And we'll let you know if we use you again. Okay, sure, sure, sure. So I'm saying, am I clearly now? You are in and out. It's a bit choppy. Um, and I think the audio that um, our virtual participants are getting is also not very good. Um, but we'll keep, we'll try for a bit, and then if not, we might have to think about maybe coming back to you um, later. Sorry about that. Um, oh, sure, 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 sure. Okay, uh, do you want me to continue? Seems like we sometimes get yeah. <laughs> good audio, so yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if we can try for a bit. Um, I think it was nice last time. Okay, wait, I will. Uh... Okay. I'm I'm doing some adjustments here. Much better. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, okay, now can you hear me? Much better. Much, Much better. better. Okay, take two. Sorry about that. Uh, technical difficulties. Okay. Okay. Uh, to repeat what I've just uh, explained no, uh, in this slide. Uh, a presidency can either serve as a sequel or a prequel to a political regime. No? Uh, most presidents in the Philippines find themselves facing different obstacles to leadership based on their relations to existing regimes. Uh, in the Philippine context, regimes consist of a prevailing political narrative, a coalition of powerful elite strategic groups, and the capacity of key states, state institutions. Uh, historically, the Philippines has gone to four regimes covering five republics. No? The nationalist regime with a narrative of the unfinished revolution or the nation waiting to be born that covered the nationalist struggle of the first republic as led by Emilio Aguinaldo. But it was uh, subsequently uh, undermined by the American colonial uh, period. And then the second republic under uh, the Japanese uh, occupation. And then it was followed by the uh, third post-war republic, which is also known as the neo-colonial or Cold War regime, which spawned the democratic Ferdinand Marcos. And Ferdinand Marcos uh, repudiated the very same regime uh, that uh, birthed his uh, first uh, two administrations, uh, first uh, two terms uh, uh, in the presidency, and of course, uh, ushered in the period of authoritarianism with his own Ford Republic. And then he was ousted after uh, uh, the EDSA People Power Revolution, which ushered in the so-called reformist regime or the EDSA uh, regime, which is the Fifth Republic uh, founded by Corazon Aquino in 1986. Now, using data from uh, uh, the varieties of democracy, we can plot the development and decay, resilience and vulnerabilities of an unconsolidated liberal democracy in the Philippines. So despite the fact that the Philippines is one of the, if not the oldest democracy in the Asian region, it has failed to consolidate 
it's democracy. But then again, democracy is a contested concept. And there are those who are saying that there is indeed a variety of democracy. So it is also worth emphasizing that democracy twice died in the country. First, during the Japanese occupation, and the second, during the 14-year uh, Marcos uh, dictatorship. Now, in a forthcoming book that I've been co-authoring for the past uh, decade or so with uh, uh, my good friend and colleague, Mark Thompson, we argue for a relational theory of presidential regimes situated in political time, a concept that we adopted from the US political scientist, Stephen Skronek, uh, in his own study of the US presidency. In our uh, version of political time, political time refers to the stage in the life cycle of a political regime, strong, which strongly influences how a presidency ascends to and maintains power. So a presidency can either be, can ascend to power as an affiliate of the existing regime or somebody who is opposed to that existing regime. Or a president uh, can ascend to power uh, when that regime is resilient and strong, it has a strong narrative, or when the regime is vulnerable. So if we will start with the uh, EDSA regime, the Fifth Republic, uh, during the fourth inauguration of uh, Ferdinand Marcos, he is no longer as strong. His narrative is no longer as strong as it was during his democratic uh, regime, uh, during his democratic administration, and at the height of his authoritarian regime. In 1986, uh, uh, he was a tired old uh, dictator who was challenged and later on uh, ousted in a people power led by uh, Corazon C. Aquino, who we can call a repudiator. He repudiated the Marcos, the authoritarian regime, and established the Fifth Republic under the 1987 Constitution. Then uh, uh, Aquino was succeeded uh, at the time when the EDSA narrative was still resilient and strong by uh, a candidate that she endorsed who became an innovator of that narrative and regime. And that, was the, that is the late Fidel Valdez Ramos. Uh, Ramos was succeeded by somebody who is not affiliated with the EDSA regime. And that is Joseph Estrada, who re-energized the populist narrative in the Philippines. And yet he, uh, he was ousted because he was not part of the EDSA narrative at the time when the EDSA narrative was still strong. But uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, who was first affiliated and later opposed to the EDSA uh, uh, narrative, the EDSA regime, uh, because of uh, uh, the scandal of uh, contested election, stolen election, became uh, disjunctive and uh, contributed to the weakening of the EDSA narrative, which uh, at the time, uh, Noy Noy Aquino attempted to bring back balance to that narrative. But it was already too late because the EDSA regime and its narrative has become uh, vulnerable and was weakened, and it paved the way for repudiation with, of course, Rodrigo Duterte. And the current administration can be seen as a continuation of the repudiation of the EDSA regime narrative. Uh, the post-EDSA reformist regime was premised on two objectives, demarcosification de uh, de and democratization. And yet, uh, it, it, it uh, hobbled through several crises in, uh, in uh, a span of three uh, decades or more. Okay? And I will skip this slide, okay? And then, of course, the, uh, the failure of the leaders of the uh, EDSA regime uh, contributed to the rise of frustration and anger and uh, uh, the failure to equitably and inclusively distribute the fruits of economic growth and development, which is part of the follies of decades of neoliberal orthodoxy 
fed into authoritarian nostalgia and revival. And most recently, no, uh, authors like Adele Webb pointed to authoritarian nostalgia, which has been silently simmering in the public's political preference since the mid 2000s. And uh, you know, voters compare life under democracy to either the growth-oriented authoritarianism of recent past, uh, the so-called meat myth of golden era, which uh, uh, resonated to Gen Y and Z, or to the rich non-democratic neighbors like Singapore in the present. You know? As early as 2005, the Asian Barometer Survey reported that 41.5% or majority 61.5% uh, agreed to some form of authoritarian rule. You know? And that is what Adele Webb points to as democratic ambivalence. You know? So uh, most respondents to all of these surveys would indicate that they are for democracy, and yet they believe that this democracy should also be guided by an iron hand. There should be some discipline in this democracy. So uh, that has always been uh, the underlying uh, uh, sentiment among majority of Filipinos. Now, why, why and how? Marcos uh, Jr. won the election. Well, several uh, analysts and pundits have pointed to democratic uh, uh, regression or the collective failure to consolidate democracy, push for political reforms, and even uh, dismantle patronage democracy. Others point to the authoritarian populism of uh, uh, the immediate past administration <laughs> of Duterte, the state-sponsored violence, the EJKs, the drug war, the red tagging, disinformation, misinformation, and trolling. Some would even say there was an edge of fatigue. Uh, the reliance of the uh, yellow and pink crowd on moral politics and elitism, the weakening of EDSA narrative, and the rise of the anti-EDSA <coughs> coalition. Those who were marginalized by EDSA, all these political uh, personalities, uh, banding together against uh, uh, the EDSA narrative. Then there's authoritarian nostalgia, as I've already mentioned, and of course, dynastic politics. <laughs> now more than ever, we have seen the complete consolidation of the country's leading and dominant political dynasties and political families. So it's a consolidation of the ethno-linguistic bailiwicks, the dynastic clans, and their patronage machinery. Um, we are now seeing a period of honeymoon, political honeymoon. So far, the public is willing to give the second Marcos presidency a chance, even those who did not vote for him. A small but significant portion will never support him, no? uh, will never uh, indicate any support. These this are the never again, never forget crowd. But a greater number are vigilant and watching the administration closely. So uh, before I end this short presentation, let us look at the democratic balance sheet so far. Uh, on the positive side, we have seen smooth democratic transition and uh, all this uh, fear of uh, instability and contested elections. Uh, did not occur because of the huge mandate that this uh, uh, administration has uh, has uh, uh, won in the election. And however, we can also uh, see the continuing rise of illiberalism, populism, and authoritarian nostalgia, which are all uh, 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 corrosive no, to democracy and its consolidation. Uh, the President Bongbong Marcos reiterated his unity mantra in his inaugural address, but his administration speaks with four thumb. Uh, he, he's, he preaches uh, unity, but his followers continue to attack the non-believers. No? There is the continued troll attacks, disinformation, and worst of all, historical distortion. Um, uh, if you read uh, Romel Kuraming's uh, uh, latest book based on his doctoral dissertation on power and knowledge, 
uh, we will see you will see that uh, Marcos the father has long been obsessed with history no uh, ever since he was a candidate until he became president and uh, there has always been a problematic relation between the Marcoses and truth and in this uh, in this environment no of uh, relative truth and alternative truths uh, that's the reason why uh, they're able to uh, pedal this their narrative, uh, especially at this time. And then, but of course, on the positive side, you have a return of the presidential style of leadership and management after the disruptive populist style of uh, Rodrigo Duterte. But then again, uh, a lot of the negative legacies of Duterte, like the war on drugs and the government debt, uh, are still uh, there, and uh, this president uh, have not indicated that he will hold the previous administration accountable. He he was lauded for appointing technocrats and professionals in his cabinet, borrowing from his father's playbook. But on the other hand, he also borrowed from his father's playbook in appointing a lot of political allies, uh, a number of which uh, has uh, dubious democratic credentials. And then he appointed some professionals from industry uh, with potential conflicts of interest. He, pre he presented a detailed economic and pandemic plan in his first State of the Nation address. However, he did not mention political reforms, governance, anti-corruption, peace process, and most especially uh, Mindanao. And then there's a question of, well, perhaps at this point, we are no longer seeing uh, the worst of the drug war and the EJK, but he refuses to fully cooperate with the ICC. So what do we expect from the second Marcos presidency? Well, it's still too early to say. Uh, we have to wait until the, uh, uh, what do you call this, the, the first 100 days and the midterms. No? So what are the prospects and possible scenarios under the second uh, Marcos presidency. Well, redemption is a powerful motivation for uh, Bongbong Marcos to perform well. But there are possible scenarios that we can uh, uh, raise at this point. No? Uh, perhaps the very first is he might repudiate the EDSA Republic. He might end it with a constitutional change, no? addressing all these uh, uh, long constitutional issues on term limits and uh, transforming the Philippines into a federal parliamentary form. But at this point, there's no indication that he will push for this. Uh, he might even become Marcos Light, no? just like what he has been projecting on social media in his blog. No? He is not as ruthless, and some would even say he's not as brilliant as his uh, father. No? As, well, he claims to be Machiavell Machiavellian, but he is actually a uh, soft authoritarian, which is the trend nowadays worldwide. No? Uh, he tends to project good vibes instead of the old OG strongman uh, image uh, like his father. Some are even saying that he might be like Noi Noi, benign. No? And he will go through the notions of reading uh, good speeches no, and uh, he will repeat his mantra of unity, just like Noy Noy Aquino uh, repeated his mantra of tuwid na daan no? uh, during his administration. And some would even say that uh, we can uh, compare the second Marcos presidency to K-drama. No? Remember Park Yun Yu, the daughter of South Korean uh, dictator Park chung hee apologized even for the sins of her father. He was the, she was the first woman president elected in South Korea, and yet two years later, she was in teach and now in prison. So uh, these are the possible scenarios. Uh, uh, again, uh, hopefully, uh, we will not see the worst, no? or else it will be a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, for this administration. And, uh, uh, it remains to be seen. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thank you, Janai. Um, we'll now turn to um, Karina, um, uh, who will talk to us about um, the macroeconomic um, situation and strategies um, that we might envision under the current um, administration. Karina, can we turn over to you? Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I don't normally uh, accept <laughs> these invitations, but I, I really couldn't say no to Hal Hill, who's a dear, dear friend of mine, and of course, Paul Hutchcroft. Um, so uh, here I am. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, Let me try and uh, give you a sort of a gist of the, the thing that I really want to say in, you know, in, in three parts, uh, or maybe four. Um, the first is really to look at the, um, the macroeconomy today as, you know, having just uh, gone through a, and still going through really this, this pandemic, uh, the pandemic, the effects of the pandemic, um, which is a very unusual shock from the normal types of economic crisis that we have experienced in the sense that this is a real physical shock as opposed to a financial one. Um, as in the Asian financial crisis or the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. And the occurrence of this crisis, um, of this pandemic has really um, shown that the Philippine economy was not uh, or is not resilient and was not uh, really prepared to handle uh, this type of uh, real physical shock. Um, the, the, yeah, and uh, the other, uh, the other uh, insight from this experience is, of course, that there are limits to the uh, usefulness of traditional uh, monetary and fiscal policy tools uh, in trying to, um, to respond to this kind of crisis that is a, uh, a physical or a real shock. To the economy. Um, then, you know, we look at uh, the numbers today, the usual numbers that um, are cited, uh, uh, and I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, whether we think that we are over the hump or not, I mean, what do the numbers really mean? Um, uh, if the if if the GDP uh, is now, you know, in 2021, went back to 19.3 trillion pesos, uh, whereas in 2020, uh, I mean, in, yeah, in 2020, it, um, it, it, you know, 2 trillion pesos uh, was shaved off the, the, the uh, GDP uh, uh, figure. Uh, you know, I was reading the paper today, the uh, FDI inflows um, have, gone up by 64% in May. Uh, unemployment uh, is down to 6% from 10% the, uh, during the uh, worst part of the, of the pandemic. Um, uh, so at bank, bank earnings are up 16.77%. Uh, NPL ratios are down to 3.75%. So, you know, on the face of it, it looks like the economy, you know, in, in, in even though it suffered a 9.6% drop in 2020, it grew by 5.7% in 2021. And uh, we're targeting uh, a 6.5 to 7.5% growth rate this year. In the first quarter, the economy grew by about 8.1 or 2%. And uh, the, in the second quarter, it slowed down a bit, but it's still growing at 7.8%. So on the face of it, numbers look like we're over the hump. Um, but, uh, but really, um, I think if we don't sort of act on the lessons or learn from the lessons that, that, uh, that, that we should have distilled from the experience of the pandemic, I think that uh, we're going to, uh, again, not be not be resilient, okay? So the point is um, we, the, the, uh, the focus should be on building resilience uh, in the economy rather than really tweaking, you know, uh, policy rates, 
to try and deal with uh, inflation and depreciate, depreciating peso and, and all this, this kind of thing that most people um, seem to be focused on. And finally, um, you know, there are a lot of myths that, um, that, are, um, that abound and persist. Uh, uh, and I think that um, one of them is, for example, that there is no fiscal space or that we, the, the, the country, you know, the, the, the macro managers have to, uh, you know, have to get on with this fiscal consolidation uh, because uh, our, our uh, debt to GDP ratio is large uh, and it, it might be unsustainable. Um, but uh, really, I think because of the drop in investments, the massive drop in invest in gross capital formation of about 27% in 2020, um, that there is a lot of, there's a need, in fact, for large public investments, for large investments in very key areas of the economy, um, all of which to me are better seen from the lens of climate change adaptation. Okay, and I think there are a lot of, you know, uh, BBM mentioned a lot of areas starting with agriculture that he wanted to focus on, uh, energy, uh, uh, all kinds of, of different uh, areas, health, education, but a lot of these uh, are really interconnected. You know, you can't really talk about uh, agriculture without, you know, <laughs> forgetting about uh, about the climate change adaptation. And we do have uh, a national plan uh, which uh, should, you know, for sustainable development uh, based on climate change adaptation, to which all uh, other sorts of programs should sort of, um, you know, be, be uh, aligned with. Um, <laughs> agriculture, health, energy security, uh, food security, um, these things are, you know, best, I think, seen from, from that kind of a framework for sustainable development. Um, so, so um, to begin, I mean, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, the context, of course, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the context of the, uh, the starting point of the BBM administration is quite different from that of the, let me just stop my video so I can look at my <laughs> notes here. It's very different from the uh, uh, starting point of the Duterte administration. When you consider it, uh, you know, Duterte inherited an economy from the Aquino administration that had grown at the yearly average rate of 6.2% over the previous five years. This is the highest average rate of growth of the economy since the 1970s. And by the end of 2016, that, that the, our economy had, had actually had 71 quarters of positive growth despite the occurrence of the uh, global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Um, and in fact, in, for the full year of 2016, we were the fastest growing economy uh, with China at 6.7% and Vietnam. Um, and poverty, uh, the poverty incidence in 2016 declined to 21.6% from 25% over, se over several decades. So, I, you know, the Aquino administration uh, really bequeathed a very strong, uh, healthy, robust economy to Duterte. Um, and in fact, uh, before this crisis, uh, this COVID-19 crisis, uh, the thinking was that the, the economy had very strong macroeconomic fundamentals and the usual macroeconomic fundamentals cited low and stable inflation, a strong fiscal position, the highest revenue to GDP effort uh, of 16.1% since 1997, the lowest debt to GDP ratio of 39.6 since 1986, that was the lowest, and the highest ever sovereign credit rating of between triple B plus to A minus 
So, um, you know, a decade of high and robust growth. Um, so everybody thought this is, you know, we, we had very strong macroeconomic uh, fundamentals. Uh, but the problem was that um, the uh, early on in the crisis, I mean, <laughs> in the pandemic, uh, we discovered that, you know, we really weren't handling the COVID, uh, the COVID problem very well. I mean, the Philippines actually used um, the longest uh, quarantine periods uh, even longer and more severe than China did. Okay, so if you look at the data from that Oxford um, group, uh, you see that we had very long, long periods of, of lockdown. Uh, and, and, and that was largely because, you know, that was the only response that the government had uh, to, the, to the COVID crisis, which was a health crisis, right? It would be, we didn't have contact tracing. We didn't have adequate labs, right? We didn't have we didn't have it, the right capacity to detect and treat uh, and isolate contact trace uh, uh, cases of uh, of COVID. Um, and surprise, you know, not surprisingly, if you look at the numbers, for example, uh, in terms of of um, um, uh, deaths per total deaths per one million population uh, as of August 6, 2020, we had the uh, second highest uh, number of deaths per one million population, second only to Indonesia, which at 20.1, ours was 19.5. Uh, but of course, you know, in, in Indonesia also has a much bigger uh, population, but we had the second highest total cases, number of cases per million population, second only to Singapore, which has a very small population. So uh, our vaccination rates were very low, uh, you know, as, as, as everyone knows. So th there really wasn't much uh, a response. The, the, the easy response was, was to simply lock down the economy. So it's, it's not really true that the reason the, the economy collapsed is because of lockdowns. It's because we didn't, we could not uh, deal with the COVID uh, situation uh, very well. And in fact, if you look at the IMF forecasts for growth in 2020 from 2019, even though in 2019, uh, the annual percentage change in real GDP was, for the Philippines was 6%. Okay, which was very high, comparable to China at 6.1%. The 2020 forecast uh, was for minus 8.3% uh, growth in GDP, uh, which was the largest forecast growth decline in ASEAN plus three countries. And in fact, uh, the economy did decline and by bigger amount, by actually by, uh, uh, by over nine, uh, over nine point. Uh, nine, about 9.6% in, uh, in 2020. Um, so, you know, if you look at the usual, um, uh, you know, statistics, so gross capital formation fell by 27.5% in 2020 from uh, three point, uh, positive 3.9% in 2019. It's since recovered, to, uh, it's, it's, it's now in positive territory, but it's still, uh, you know, that, that very large drop in, in, uh, in gross capital formation, I think is a very significant thing and really points to the need for, uh, for more investments uh, in the economy. Um, okay, what else? The, um, So I already said that GDP in billions of pesos, okay, trillion, two, about two, two trillion pesos worth of uh, GDP uh, was shaved off GDP in 2020, but it's bounced back to 19.39 uh, trillion, 19 trillion uh, in uh, 2021. So which is why most people think, oh, okay, we're, we're, we're home safe now, you know, but, but not really. So, um, if you look at the kinds of uh, plans or 
you know, the eight point plan versus the 10 point uh, plan of Duterte, there's really very little difference uh, between the items mentioned in these uh, eight and 10 point plans. So Bongbong Bong Marcos says, uh, that, that this is what uh, Ben Diokno announced the day after the sauna, right? The eight point plan uh, for the near and medium term includes protect the purchasing power of families by ensuring food security, reducing transport and logistics costs, uh, reducing energy costs, reduce the vulnerability and mitigate the scarring uh, effects from the COVID-19 pandemic by tackling health, strengthening social protection and addressing learning losses, ensure sound macroeconomic fundamentals by improving bureaucratic efficiency and ensuring sound fiscal management, create more jobs by promoting investments, improving infrastructure and ensuring energy security among others, create quality jobs by increasing employability, encouraging research and development and innovation and enhancing the digital economy, create green jobs by pursuing a green and blue economy and establishing livable and sustainable communities, uphold public order and safe, uh, safety, peace and security and ensure a level playing field by strengthening market, market competition and reducing barriers to entry and limits to entrepreneurship. If you uh, compare that to Duterte's 10 point plan going in, Duterte said the institution of progressive tax reform, increasing competitive, uh, competitiveness and easing the cost of doing business, accelerating annual uh, infrastructure spending, increasing agricultural productivity and rural tourism, encouraging investments and ensuring security of land tenure and addressing bottlenecks in land management and titling agencies investing in human capital development, including health and education systems, promoting science, technology, and the creative arts to enhance innovation, improving social protection programs, including the conditional cash transfer program, and strengthening the implementation of the responsible parenthood and reproductive health program. They're very similar, except for that last one, which is strengthening, and strengthening the implementation of the responsible parenthood, uh, responsible parenthood and reproductive health law, which was correct. Uh, from, uh, you know, I, I, I would support that very strongly uh, as part of the overall uh, reforms in the health, uh, in the, in the, in the health uh, sector. But, but by and large, I mean, it's really, <laughs> it's, it looks the same, right? I mean, they, they touch on the same uh, uh, themes and topics. And it's, it's also similar to the slogan, in fact, that Marcos Sr. Uh, in his first administration, um, uh, 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 had, which was rice, roads, and schoolhouses. So I, I don't have much time to, to talk about uh, the rest of it, but uh, all I can say is uh, in terms of, um, in terms of what, the, what the economic manager should be doing, I think there are very little detail, there were, there are little details provided, but I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think uh, focusing, you know, having a framework of, of climate adaptation for sustainable development is one. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, being able to actually utilize uh, taxpayer money uh, efficiently and making these investments. Uh, there is, to my mind, uh, at least from some of the studies that we've done, uh, there is ample fiscal space. There is ample fiscal space, so the 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 the, the, the economic manager should not be gun shy to spend because you have to spend. You actually have to spend, uh, and um, and agriculture uh, pro agriculture productivity can best be promoted by increasing competition. It's not true that there has been uh, unbridled liberalization in in agriculture. So. Um, you know, there are lots of other things I could say, but I don't have enough time. So I'll just leave it up to the people to uh, ask questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karina. Absolutely, we will have, I think that we have a lot of our Q&A to flesh these out and, and absolutely a lot of important points um, to cover ground. So thank you so much. Um, and last, we now turn to Jay um, by Tom Marco to talk about uh, foreign policy and geostrategic outlook um, in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Let me just uh, make sure I have my timer on. So that's <laughs> okay. Uh, I was asked to give, uh, well, to deliver a talk on uh, G the uh, Philippine foreign policy and, and geopolitical uh, context and essentially try to give my uh, reading of, um, well, to give my forecasts on it. I don't use a crystal ball. I prefer tarot cards, but still. Uh, despite that, I have to give some caveats uh, before I um, give my opinion. First of all, of course, the usual caveat, these are, of course, personal views and uh, not representative of that of any institution. Uh, second, and this might be unusual, uh, this uh, talk, uh, what I will say, will have a uh, an expiry date, <laughs> uh, like, like what you find on, on food. Uh, the analysis is probably mostly valid for about 10 months or up to May 2023. <laughs> Uh, the reason for that is that there is likely going to be a cabinet reshuffle uh, due to the end of the one-year ban on appointments of candidates in the last elections, now, meaning they, they cannot uh, be appointed to positions in government by the, uh, by the president. So his allies uh, during uh, this, this last uh, campaign uh, will not really be uh, visible, will not have a clear hand in the governance until that time. No? And you see this in the fact that there are some key positions that are actually being held by officers in charge. No? Uh, probably the most notable one is the Secretary of National Defense. Officially, he's still an officer in charge. No? So because of that, there's no warranties on the, on the longevity of some of these, uh, these uh, statements of mine. However, uh, let, let's uh, uh, just uh, go ahead anyway. Um, um, Julio has uh, given you uh, quite uh, a lot of information on some of the considerations uh, that would shape the uh, geopolitical strategy or, or posture, shall we say, of the Philippines in the coming months. Mm -hmm. So the so-called Marcos restoration or the second Marcos regime, uh, there are a lot of factors uh, to unpack there. But let's just uh, say that Marcos Jr., the new president, has quite a lot to prove uh, uh, domestically and internationally, especially since his candidature uh, and his potential win was viewed uh, negatively, especially by, well, not only by uh, uh, domestic, uh, well, Filipino um, um, sectors, but even in the international community, notably international investments and, and uh, business houses and credit rating agencies. Now, that has an impact, of course, on how uh, he makes decisions, especially in this first uh, year of his term. No? Uh, he really has to prove that he can uh, uh, govern effectively no? and credibly. Uh, also, uh, one other um, consideration is the need for uh, Marcos Jr. to stabilize, essentially, uh, Philippine society and government in, this, in, in the next few months, given uh, number one, uh, he needs to address and manage a significant proportion of the Philippine population actually not trusting him at all. Uh, and this can potentially translate into unrest no, that might later on uh, create more problems for him. Uh, he also needs, uh, incidentally, when it comes to uh, uh, geopolitical issues, he needs to respond to and abide by public opinion, which has been very, very strong, as noted earlier, with respect to the South China Sea and West Philippine Sea, and with respect to the China policy particularly. Uh, despite all of Duterte's efforts, China, uh, as uh, earlier indicated, still is the least trusted among uh, the various countries and potential partners of the Philippines. Uh, and uh, the traditional partners like the U.S. Is still rate very, very highly, uh, the U.S. and Japan. So um, uh, the administration has to put their best foot forward uh, within uh, the coming year uh, before uh, an audience of domestic supporters, uh, a, a potentially sizable position, which is right now quite latent no? and still getting its bearings, shall we say, and the skeptical international community. Uh, and in addition, stability is important because he needs to, to weather a uh, economic crisis. Now, uh, some factors uh, that we need to consider uh, in sort of anticipating uh, the geopolitical posture at this point is number one, uh, a personal yeah. inclination, shall we say. No? Uh, the family, the Marcos family's cultural, social, economic uh, background uh, and their 
<laughs> financial affinity shall we say uh, to the west us australia and and europe you know uh, that is shall we say ingrained you know, in in their character and unlike duterte uh, in the previous administration they do not appear to have very intense personal grudges against uh, the us or the west um, um second you no know, uh, when you look at um say um marcos senior you know, his father's uh um, um policies towards uh, china and taiwan historically there is a, an element of transactionalism there uh, that is uh, uh quite present and prominent uh and so the relationship uh, between uh, the philippines and these two countries could also be similarly characterized and the thing is that um, in this uh, particular uh, scenario, um, as long as the business ties, the economic uh, opportunities uh, and interests of either China and Taiwan are not, are not in competition with uh, personal or family interests, shall we say, or that of their allies, then this could actually work for them, meaning that uh, there would be stable and relatively quiet and non-controversial uh, relations with these uh, countries. Um, third is we've seen initially at, at the very least no, a, a reliance on technocrats. No? This could be uh, because he is following his father's uh, playbook, which worked initially in the early years of uh, uh, the, Marcos, uh, the first Marcos administration, but also because we are facing very complex and uh, scale, well, macroeconomic challenges. Uh, at a time when the Philippines now has serious uh, fiscal constraints due to the financial policies and decisions of the Duterte administration. The space, uh, really, uh, the fiscal space is very narrow at this point. Uh, earlier, there's mention of the uh, debt to the GDP ratio, for example, uh, as of, uh, what was it, a month or two uh, ago, there are already reports that it is already reaching the, well, quite close to the so there's very little room for more uh, loans. Um, and so that, that represents an additional challenge which requires uh, probably which uh, incentivize resort to perhaps. No? Um, also, uh, we should consider the local political style, shall we say, the, uh, the way uh, that the Marcos family governed uh, in the Ilocos region is essentially to give the people at the minimum to keep them content, no? even if they're not static and happy, but at least they're content, uh, such as if they have nice roads and there is general peace and quiet no? uh, for most of the time, even if they're poor, as long as they're content, then uh, that will be manageable and will be advantageous to the administration. Okay. Now, uh, another factor we need to there is that there are well at this point this early perhaps uh, there are some internal issues no and this is due to the conundrum that china represents there have been some initial differences between the secretary of foreign affairs the secretary of national defense and the national security advisor on the specific uh, approach or posture to take with respect to china the south china sea the United States and the geopolitical arena as a whole, you no, know, and how the Philippines would fit in that. And um, although now we're beginning to see some, you know, um, um, discipline, shall we say, being imposed on public statements, uh, um, there has, uh, th there is still uh, that possibility that these uh, fissures will continue, uh, and. Um, this is this is on account of, of well some some conditions that we've seen early on. One is with respect to the national security advisor. There, there is a sense that there was some overreach uh, early on. That um, it seemed like some statements were preempting the positions of say foreign affairs or defense, even the climate change commission. Um, and also, you have the situation of ambivalence, shall we say, uh, uh, due to the fact that the Secretary of National Defense is officially only an, an officer in charge at this point. And, um, well, on the bright side, you, you had strong and clear positioning on the part of the Secretary of Foreign Affairs. But as I said, no, I mean, you still have that one year uh, um, period to contend with. Okay, um, This might 
be uh, representative of a potential um, factionalization over the security and and uh, geopolitical uh, um, perspectives. Uh, so there might be contested, uh, well, there, there might be some contests with respect to that. Uh, however, you have you do have the uh, public uh, statements of the president uh, providing at least some parameters. No, so uh, particularly important were his statements on not ceding even a millimeter now of of uh, Philippine sovereignty, um, maintaining the respect to the um, South China Sea arbitration, no? and signaling uh, the signals that uh, we will. Uh, continue to uh, stand by the alliance, the Philippine-US alliance. No? So um, any kind of differences probably at this point will will be more uh, debated within the security cluster, unlike under the previous administration where it seemed to be divided between the economic and security clusters. No? Um, so and these these uh, differences uh, would probably revolve around China, the China policy. And the management of the alliance. Now, whether that will get more serious, uh, whether that the gap, any gaps will widen, will emerge probably later uh, after the one-year ban is over, and if we see, uh, shall we say, more permanent uh, appointments to these important uh, positions. Now, and, and lastly, of course, we should not discount the possible influence of the fact that certain aspects, such as well, certain features of this geopolitical arena, like the Philippine EEZ, uh, the Kalayan Island Group, um, Philippine Sovereignty Group, Kalayan Island Group, these were essentially established under the watch of the of Marcos Senior. No, it was he who issued the decrees. It was he who decided uh, ultimately to occupy the features and to stake the Philippines' uh, claims uh, into these areas. No, and these cannot be uh, discounted. No, they're actual concrete achievements or contributions of the first Marcos regime to the country's um, evolution as a state. No? And it would be important for the current administration to maintain that uh, uh, legacy, uh, so-called. No? And so we could, uh, these are um, factors that would push towards, well, push the geopolitical posture towards certain positions. Okay. Now, um, this uh, leads me to think that um, initially, even though there was some, there were some differences no, um, um, that emerged, no, um, there would be a potential restabilization and a revaluation, shall we say, of the Philippine-US uh, alliance and the defense uh, relations. Uh, the president's statement so far uh, about evol evolving this uh, alliance seems to be indicative of this interest to further refine uh, the alliance and modernize it, no? uh, particularly the terms or the implementation of the mutual defense treaty. Okay, now uh, this is logical because really under the past administration, the third administration, this has been uh, um, the, the need for this has been appreciated by the defense establishment, and perhaps were it not for the pandemic we could have seen some uh, of that evolution already. No? Now, uh, hopefully this will um, continue. And as the pandemic wanes a bit, uh, then there will be more to put more opportunities for this to uh, develop further. We will see, however, uh, despite this continued cultivation of Philippine-China economic relations. No? Uh, and these economic relations, we have to look at it from two perspectives. One is... Um, economic relations from, from say, the state-to-state -state level, uh, whether it's through overseas development assistance or government-to-government -government transactions uh, concerning economic uh, uh, transfers or benefits. No? On this part, on this aspect, I think we will see some kind of um, arm's length dealing no? uh, on account of the presence of the technocrats who are in the economic uh, cluster. Uh, given the experience under the Duterte administration, where despite uh, Duterte's affinity for China, um, China was still not able to deliver uh, on the supposed promises made, uh, I would think that uh, the economic managers of the current administration would be very well aware of that and would still uh, try to, uh, well, would still demand that China basically change the way it does business. No? Because 
one of the apparent complaints under the previous administration was that China was simply not able to move fast enough and to comply with uh, the various uh, standards and requirements of the Philippines for things like uh, foreign loans or foreign uh, assistance projects. So uh, that's what slowed them down. No? So unless China, China um, changes the way uh, it does its business uh, in this respect, then we will continue to see very slow movement on this. However, this contrasts with the private economic uh, relations. Uh, uh, here, uh, some scholars have noted that the, the, despite the slowness of official development assistance and government-to-government -government transactions, actually the Philippines received a lot of money through private channels, not a private um, a Chinese um, business uh, investments coming into the private sector, no? Chinese, rich Chinese people coming to the Philippines and, and setting up businesses here. Um, now, of course, these can be potential competitors to locally uh, entrenched businesses, but they could also be potential rich partners for those trying to move up the economic ladder. Okay? Um, so we would see uh, probably an increase uh, still in uh, um, the um, creation of partnerships and joint ventures um, as long as they would support or complement a private, uh, well, the local Filipino uh, business uh, interests. No? Um, this is likely to lead in concentration and growth of Chinese money in the Philippines. Um, and if we consider, um, um, well, uh, if we consider this in, in, in the current context, this could, however, be the source of security problems or security issues because, uh, well, under the previous administration, it was already noted that some of these uh, private uh, business uh, investments by Chinese businesses were, seemed to be very strategically placed around major facilities of the armed forces, for example, or they could represent potential uh, threats to the uh, security apparatus of the, the country. Okay? And um, for example, there have been discussions about uh, how to protect um, Philippine uh, strategic uh, um, um, sectors like telecommunications, transportation, et cetera, from being overwhelmed by uh, potentially Chinese uh, business investments, and okay, so that that will create that will be uh, something uh, of of interest, uh, and then we could also see uh, a return uh, on the part of the Philippines um, to emphasizing multilateralism and ASEAN in dealing with these um, geopolitical issues, and particularly with the South China Sea. Uh, however, um, well, the past several years have actually greatly weakened the ability and influence of ASEAN on this. Uh, but at least uh, we could see the Philippines uh, trying to, again, do what it can to re-strengthen and re-center uh, um, ASEAN in, in this. No? So, well, overall, it seems like we're trending towards a foreign policy that is more um, conventional or traditional, shall we say, uh, maybe more like uh, the style of President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo back in the early 2000s, where um, in, in, terms of in, in, in the geopolitical arena, the, the tendency of the, the, the Philippines was to try to cultivate the U.S. for military and, and, and um, um, security uh, um, benefits while still trying to extract um, um, economic uh, benefits from China. Okay, Now, um, what this uh, also means is that uh, we could expect, at very least within the next year, the Philippines to try to work towards um, equidistant, shall, uh, well, nominally equidistant uh, positions between the U.S. and the Philippines. However, we have to be aware as well that it, that equidistance would be inherently skewed or constrained in reality. And uh, unfortunately, I think the location, the exact location between the two, uh, between China and the U.S. will be increasingly defined, uh, actively defined by China, no? because China has a lot more economic carrots and military sticks uh, um, to uh, present to the Philippines. Uh, 
um, the U.S. still has a lot to catch up on, no? and the military alliance is simply not enough. No? Uh, it only addresses one particular aspect of this geopolitical competition, and uh, we're aware that China's strategy towards this is a lot broader, no? uh, a lot more diverse, no? not just military, but also economic, uh, social, cultural, etc. Uh, and the range of uh, tactics that are available to them uh, really span everything from the legitimate to illegitimate ones. No? And we're particularly worried about the expansion of gray zone uh, activities for, uh, in the South China Sea. And I mean, despite all of this, the Philippines up to now still has no grand strategy of its own on how to navigate this uh, geopolitical uh, arena. We will see continued frictions in the West Philippine Sea and the South China Sea, of course. No? Uh, on one hand, the Philippines is still driven by its economic imperatives for energy and food security. And China's claims in the South China Sea effectively contradict uh, the uh, Philippines, no? uh, counter its uh, drive towards economic development. No? There is a looming energy shortfall. Uh, which is, uh, well, energy, of course, is fundamental for any uh, growth in the industrial and service sector, which is gaining more uh, and more of uh, a, a bigger, bigger uh, share of the pie of the Philippines' uh, productivity. Um, and this could lead to an increasingly urgent uh, scramble for energy security. Uh, I noticed that today there's already a news item about the newly installed energy secretary already uh, expressing some worries about next year's energy situation. Uh, and that, in part, is due to the um, decrease in, well, the more constrained energy supplies, not just because of uh, prices and, and supply constraints, but also because of the Malampaya uh, gas platform, which has been supplying around 20 to 30 percent of Luzon's energy needs. That uh, production is, is is beginning to wind down already, okay? And yeah, there's no replacement for it yeah, because yeah, we'll of now, obstacles. Right. So now we have time for Q&A. Yeah. I'm sure we'll be able to come back to it. I'm very sorry. But um, if you want to um, say a final word, um, and then we'll open up for Q&A. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Did you want to finish off um, on a? Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. Actually, I was, I was uh, With that, um, we will again. Um, um, well, actually, I was going to the the conclusion. Uh, given that uh, what we're looking at is a foreign policy that might be characterized as as speaking softly but making it look like you can get big sticks. <laughs> which is uh, which sort of counters uh, the previous administrations speak hysterically while sticking it to allies and friends. Okay, so perhaps that's a welcome change. But again, uh, you know, good for the next year at least, and probably next year we should have another one of these to to reassess <laughs> the situation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh covered a lot of ground and I'm sure we have um, uh, a lot of questions from both the in-person audience and virtually. We'll go through the first round um, uh, and then we'll come back for another round. So please, um, I know we have some questions already lined up. Um, we have uh, Hal, Hal Gill, who's got a question um, and then we'll take um, uh, the question from online. Hal, over to you. Yes. Uh, uh, hi, 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 Maria. Thank you, and hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, can you hear me? Okay, I'm speaking from a, a farm in rural Victoria. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, to uh, Karina, uh, Karina, thanks for lovely to see you, and thanks very much as always for a really interesting presentation. You, you covered so much ground with a lot of authority. So thanks very much. And it's hard to really think what I could add. Can I just pose a question, perhaps? Uh, and it's really just drawing you out from your presentation a little bit. And the question really is, um, should we be veered towards optimism or you know, concern or pessimism about the new regime? Sort of thinking about the optimistic scenario, it's it's, for example, you know, the star cabinet, including your your colleagues from the School of Economics at UP, uh, you know, the best of the best, of course, in, in, in th those three cases. 
Uh, you're past the worst of COVID, as you mentioned. Uh, and then I guess lessons have been learned from past crises. Philippine policymakers you know, know how to handle most crises, although, as you said, the health crisis really was quite different. Uh, and perhaps uh, Bambang will simply delegate. You know, he's got a very good cabinet. In, in many cases, he'll simply delegate. That seems to me, that's, is that, that's how you'd construct an optimistic scenario, I guess, is it? But then if you wanted to construct a more worrisome scenario, would it be something like, um, <laughs> I'm just guessing, but Bambang is sort of, a, if I may say so, a sort of policy-free zone, as far as we know, uh, as July also mentioned, I guess, in, in passing. Uh, of course, as several people have said, his father had the very uh, able technocrats in the cabinet from the beginning, mostly from UP again, uh, but that didn't really stop the economy going off the rails. Uh, and the other point, I guess, which you touched on is the global economic environment this year started off looking reasonably benign, but now it's looking quite tough. You know, Ukraine, China, you know, global global recession possibly looming. And then there's that, that key point you mentioned that Philippines you know, looked so good pre-COVID, but then it was the worst affected of all the Southeast Asian economies in 2020. Um, and for the reasons you mentioned in that nice paper you wrote with Toby Monson. So I suppose, can we try to make sense of the optimistic and the worrisome scenarios? Which way do you veer? And crucially, uh, how much of the lessons been learned from the recent episode and as a basis for going forward? Uh, but again, thanks very much. A really interesting presentation. I enjoyed it. Well, thank you, Hal. As usual, you have a very complex question. I could give another speech on oh, all of it. I'm sorry but, about um, that. <laughs> I, I, I think um, one reason uh, for optimism I have is the fact that uh, at least the, the, the head of the economic team understands that um, uh, the economy needs to grow first and foremost. Mm. I mean, that is uh, top of the, of the, I mean, the main focus. Um, sure, we have to consolidate fiscally at some point and we have to worry about uh, debt to GDP and all this. Uh, but he understands that uh, there are trade-offs involved, but, the, but it should never be the case where uh, we, we sacrifice uh, growth. And in fact, he understands that uh, growth in the economy will make that debt uh, sustainable in the long run. So, so that, that gives me a lot of reason for optimism. Um, I'm not very uh, uh, optimistic. I mean, the reasons for pessimism maybe are, are a lot more in the sense that uh, um, I think that the, as I said, the framework is, is sort of uh, fragmented. You know, there should be like uh, a, a um, I think uh, a realization that the government needs to uh, infuse, invest in, in, uh, in, in key areas. These are all some, somehow related to, 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 to climate change adaptation. Uh, you know, whether you're talking about agricultural productivity, health, uh, energy security, food security, all of these, you know, um, can be seen through a, a, a climate change lens instead of looking at these as different sort of sectors. Um, and the idea is really to build uh, capacity, you know. So, so the COVID uh, the COVID crisis showed us how little capacity we have in the health sector to to detect and treat cases. I mean, our lab capacity was was lower, much lower than Vietnam's, for example. You know, so um, so building capacity. I mean, if you look at the if you look at the statistics uh, in that that nice uh, book that that uh, Carlo Panello and Orville Salon and Alex Serin put out. If you look at the uh, health outcomes in this country, you know, the, it was about providing a continuum of care to the poor. Some of the MDGs um, uh, that uh, targets have not been met. I mean, maternal mortality has remained at 205 deaths per 100,000 births, which has not changed in the last 30 years. Uh, childhood stunting, uh, one out of three children under the age of five is stunted. And that ref is reflective of, you know, the, 
uh, mental and cognitive abilities uh, of these children. So uh, all of these things uh, are areas in which uh, government needs to invest more. So when we talk about uh, education or improving human capital, we're not just talking about you know, going back to face-to-face -face classes and building more classrooms or, or getting the newest textbooks and uh, computers available. It's really asking the question, why do only 80 out of uh, 100 students uh, complete grade school? Uh, you know, and, and, and then you, you go back to things like, well, they, they, they don't have enough nutrition, right? They, uh, they cannot access, I mean, they can't get to the schools because there are no roads. I mean, all kinds of uh, questions. And, and all of these starts from, uh, from, uh, from, you know, from mother, you know, from, from pregnancy. And then this is why this reproductive health thing is so important. You know, if you, if you only invested in, in, uh, in reproductive health and prenatal care, and nutrition for children, uh, at least until until grade school and high school, I think you'd have a much better population uh, to begin with. Um, so I, I'm just worried that, uh, you know, and some of the things like agricultural productivity, what are the things that constrain the country from being, uh, you know, uh, productive in agriculture? It's really uh, the fact that the government has since time immemorial protected this sector. I mean, the government buys input. And again, Bong Bong mentioned it during his sauna. The government is going to buy inputs at cheap prices and, 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 and you know, at subsidize again, the farmers. And that OECD study in 2021 showed the Philippines is one of the high, most has one of the most protected agricultural sectors uh, in the world. Uh, we have a lot of uh, quotas and non-tariff barriers in place, and we have high tariffs. Now, rice, for example, uh, thank goodness for the rice tariffication law, food and non-alcoholic beverages contribute about 43% to the inflation rate. So it's, it's not, you know, while inflation in, indeed is, uh, you know, uh, is sort of imported from abroad because we're small of an economy, some of the things that uh, we're doing uh, to ourselves uh, is hurting. I mean, it's contributing to this, uh, to this inflation problem. We have a shortage of food, uh, not just rice, but even fish. And even fish has uh, a non-tariff barrier. There's a, you need to, to get a certificate of necessary importation in order to import fish. Uh, so, you know, I'm just worried that uh, and nobody ever talked about nobody ever talked about um, liberalizing agriculture as a way to raise productivity. So I'm, you know, it seems to me they're barking up the wrong tree, and they're they're essentially inflicting more of the so-called remedies from the past. Now on the fiscal space uh, issue that 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 Jay mentioned also, I, I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding about uh, uh, about the amount of fiscal space uh, that countries actually have. Um, I have another uh, study with Toby and another uh, friend of ours, um, which estimated these, this fiscal space in climate vulnerable countries. And uh, if you actually factor in fiscal fatigue and uh, you know, look at the fact, consider the fact that the difference between nominal interest rates and projected growth rates still negative. The real interest rates in the world have, are negative. And real interest rates actually have been declining in the last 30 years for reasons like productivity, demographics, etc. It's actually the time to- yeah, we'll have to cut you short so that we have another round of questions. But so, so the bottom line is I think that there, there's a lot of fragmentation in the approach. And there's a lot of there are a lot of uh, misconceptions about how to deal with uh, with particular issues. So that that's what worries me. Thank you. I think that in the interest of time, I'll read um, the two questions lined up for July and for Jay. Um, and this is from David Camro. Um, July, uh, David asked um, in relation to Bong Bong and his better his longevity. 
is tied to um, uh, Imelda being um, alive and 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 how much of this is um, you know the scenarios that you have in mind and not whether he will distance himself from his father. So I think it speaks to the that life cycle. Um, and dynasties that we were talking about. Um, so it's sounding on that, and particularly because of Inalda at this stage. And, um, and then Jay, the question for you is around the centrality of Adrian. And so whether you can speak more about that um, uh, in terms of this geopolitical strategy. Um, but please, um, if we want to have another round, I'm very um, uh, looking at our in-person participants. It's hopefully we get a chance to turn to them as well. Thank you. Over to you, July, and then Jane. Oops, you're on. Uh, okay, on. sorry. Okay, quickly. Um, yeah, uh, it's common knowledge that uh, uh, it was Imelda who really pushed Bong Bong to uh, to run for the presidency, especially after 2010 when Noi Noi uh, won the presidency. So uh, Imelda wanted, uh, of course, his own unico hijo to become president. So he was really, uh, she was the one who really pushed uh, Bong Bong to, to run. But of course, uh, learning from the lessons of the failed 2016 vice presidential run, uh, they, they, they tested uh, the market, the electoral market, and found out that Imelda was more of a liability than an advantage to the political campaign. So in 2022, 2022 uh, they just hid her under the bed or in, inside the closet. And they, they refocused their attention on uh, glorifying uh, Ferdinand Sr., especially on the social media, on uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and TikTok. Uh, they really, really uh, portrayed uh, Ferdinand Marcos as uh, the, the leader of the gold, so-called golden age of Philippine uh, uh, economy. So, uh, yeah. So uh, I think that's the answer. Uh, they uh, they learned from the uh, they learned from 2016, and Imelda was more of a liability. And uh, of course, now the narrative of Bong Bong is largely anchored on that of his father, a man of destiny. Okay, thank you. Jane. Yes. Yes, uh, on, on the uh, two questions I, I actually put, put in on, on the chat as well. No? Uh, with respect to ASEAN, I did mention that uh, as a result of, of the, the current situation, uh, it seems like the Philippines will probably return to emphasizing uh, ASEAN and trying to put it back in a more central position with respect to the South China Sea especially. Um, and... The, and the code of contact negotiations are still the only game in town with respect to ASEAN uh, and the South China Sea. The problem, of course, is that ASEAN has been severely weakened um, in the past years. And its ability to influence uh, the South China Sea disputes, whether on a uh, broader scale or individually on a bilateral level, has been uh, um, diminishing um, quite clearly. No? Uh, so. Um, it's really um, um, a problem uh, it, because ASEAN in the first place was not designed for political uh, security issues and the past years have demonstrated that. Huh? And their best, uh, um, their, their, uh, the, its capacities and capabilities are, are better left to the economic uh, community building at this point. Um, on Myanmar, uh, it's not likely that um, Marcos Jr., at least in the near term, will take any initiative on this because, uh, well, on one hand, the, the non-interference principle of ASEAN inherently militates against any kind of initiative like that. No? Uh, it might be viewed as uh, interference. And so anything beyond what ASEAN has already done, which is to issue its, its uh, consensus statement and to try to reach out through official representatives, I think that is the limit to which uh, ASEAN can move on this. Uh, individual countries uh, will um, then try, will probably just try to maintain relations and ensure that their own uh, interests are protected. And with respect to Myanmar, I think this is really more protecting Philippine uh, citizens, if any, and any business interests uh, there. But um, um, going so far as to try to to um, re-establish democracy, I think that might be um, stepping uh, um, beyond certain lines. 
Uh, and second, um, so far we haven't heard Marco Senior express any opinion either way on developments in other countries, uh, especially in the SEA at this point. So we still have to wait and see. For now, that means that we have to rely on DFA, uh, which is going to take a more conventional and traditional posture, as I said, no, and and that means um, um, not much uh, movement uh, or not much, not too big initiatives at this point. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate the um, timekeeping of our um, speakers. I'm very grateful. It's a very difficult topic, and I'm also very fascinated.